Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to be doing another Hamera install, formerly known as Hermes, but it's on the Ender 5 Plus. So in front of me, I have most of what I'm going to need for the install. Um, first, we're going to need a bracket, some sort of a mount system to mount the Hamera onto the X carriage here. Um, it's not gonna bolt directly on. In this case, we'll have the link to the Thingiverse uh, item for this mount that we've printed. And it's using this kind of dovetail system where the two pieces slide together and then they're locked together with some screws. So we've got one side that's going to mount onto the X carriage and then this will mount on the Hermes and they made up with those slots. Uh, the Ender 5 Plus comes with a BL Touch. Uh, we're not going to be able to use the stock BL Touch mounting uh, position, at least not with this particular mount. So I'll be using the BL Touch and fan mount that I made in a previous video um, that will mount on the front of the Hamera uh, using the T-slots. And then the BL Touch has this adjustable mount on the side of the fan bracket. And we'll be putting a 4020 fan here. So you'll need a 4020 fan as well. And then three M3 by 20 millimeter bolts for the cooling fan. For the little captive nut that holds the BL touch bracket, we're using these tiny square um, M3 nuts. Uh, these nuts will also have in the description below. These nuts have to be two millimeters thin. If they're any thicker, they won't fit in the T-slots of the Hamera if you end up planning on using them in that way. Um, it does come with spares in the box. Uh, but I just like to have them uh, be able to be interchangeable if I need. And then we have a cooling shroud or a fan shroud to direct the airflow to the nozzle tip. This one is by Joe Kasha. We used it in a previous video as well. Um, you could feel free to use any kind of fan mount and uh, shroud setup you'd like. And then for this particular mount, we're going to need four M3 by eight millimeter screws. They can't be any longer than eight millimeters or they'll bottom out on the T-slots of the Hamera. And then two M3 by 12, but they can be longer. And those two M3 by 12s are to lock these two plates together and they will just thread into these slots on the back of this plate. They're just kind of self-tapping in that regard. If you would like, you could use a longer M3 screw to uh, attach these two plates and just um, drill this out and put a uh, embed a little nut in the back. Much like these little square nuts, you could just kind of melt them in the back there um, if you wanted to have more of a positive locking system. Obviously, we need a selection of Allen keys or Allen drivers. We're gonna need a soldering iron and some solder. And in my case, I'm using flux as well. Uh, I'm using a butane soldering iron. Um, I like it because it does double duty. I can use it to also uh, tighten the heat shrink. Um, because it does have to let the hot gas out the side of the tip here, so I use that as kind of like a heat gun on the side. Um, you do need, obviously, um, some heat shrink as well uh, for all the soldering connections. Um, because we are going to be cutting the thermistor wire and the fan wires, um, we'll be leaving, obviously, the BL touch wires in place. Um, I'm also going to be using, in my case, um, super glue. So this is kind of like a two-part. Uh, there's an activator and then the standard super glue. Um, this is miter bond. Uh, I find this is the cheapest way to acquire this much super glue. Um, and that's because this fan shroud just sticks in the end of the fan is designed to be super glued on. Depending on what you're using, if you're using a different one, it might actually bolt on, in which case you obviously don't need the super glue for that. And uh, last but not least, we need the Hamera. Um, so this is a 24 volt system. So we have the 24 volt Hamera here. Um, the key differences there really is just the heater cartridge is 24 volt and the fan, the cooling fan for the heat sink side is also 24 volt. In the interest of time, I unpacked the Hamera onto the table here. Um, as we assemble it, I'll go over the different bags and the components that are included with the unit. So first things first, I'm gonna take the fan shroud off. There are two M3 screws, one here and one kind of beside the BL touch. So now both the, the cover here and the BL touch are kind of free. And I'm going to keep these aside. Okay. And we're not using any of this hot end anymore, obviously. So take those two M3 screws out also. 
So before this gets damaged, I'm just gonna disconnect the DL touch and put it aside. And we're not going to be using Bowden at all anymore, um, but we can leave the Bowden tube there and just use it as uh, like a guide to guide the filament up. And then that way we can still have the filament roll on the normal roll holder and then, or a spool holder, and then feed it up through where the old extruder used to be, and then have it just follow the, um, the PTFE as, as like a, like I said, like a guide. Um, you can try to take out the PTFE from the hot end by removing this little retaining clip, and then press down this little collar. You wanna push that down, and then with any luck, you'll actually be able to get the PTFE out. If you've been using your printer, this is a lot more difficult. I would probably just cut the PTFE at the top since we're not really using the rest of this anymore. And just gonna get rid of the zip tie there to try to peel some of this back. Okay, another one. So take note of the color of the wires. Uh, blue and yellow are for the cooling fan. I'm um, just gonna snip those a little ways back. And then the red and black are for the hot end cooling fan or the heat sink cooling fan. And then um, obviously these two red silicone ones are for the heater cartridge and the white ones are for the thermistor. Okay, so I'm just cutting all those, I don't know, four, four inches or so back from the hot end to release this. And then we won't be needing any of this anymore either. So I'm just going to push back the braided sleeve here and zip tie this to keep it out of my way for the rest of the session. So we're going to test fit our X carriage side of the bracket now. On the back of the bracket, there are these two larger kind of cutouts, and that's to provide spacing for the bolt heads here. And then these two holes here are meant to have these two standoffs that the hot end used to be bolted to slide into. Um, sometimes when you print them, there might not be enough clearance for them to slide right in. And if that's the case, just drill these out a little bit further um, to allow them to just friction fit on. We want it to be tight to keep everything kind of aligned. All right, so a little bit of reaming later, and this is a good tight fit here. Now we can bolt these together. You could use M3 by eights, um, or you can just reuse the two from the fan shroud. They're not quite M3 by eights. They're a little bit shorter, but that's fine. We just wanna make sure that they're not so long that they end up uh, hitting any of the X rail. Okay, so I've got those two nice and snug. Um, for some extra security, um, I guess you could put another one in there. Um, this one here would likely end up uh, contacting the other part of the bracket that slides in, so I wouldn't put one there, but you could throw another one in there, but honestly, that's not going anywhere. Um, and just as a side note, I printed all of these out of ABS. Um, you're, you're probably fine with PLA, but I would want to print it in the highest temperature material you're able to comfortably print in. And then we can attach the uh, other part of the bracket to the Hemera. So we're going to use the included uh, square nuts that the Hemera comes with um, in the bag labeled M Fix Hermes, or Hemera, I guess. Uh, there are four of those square nuts. We only need two, um, not on the side with the labeling, on the back side. Slide them in the side of the T-nuts or the T-slots, sorry, like that. And then place that down on the table. And then this bracket is designed to go like this. Give it a test fit. Um, make sure everything slides nice and smooth. Um, if you need to, you can file down these little sections here to make sure that it's a nice, uh, nice fit. It should be pretty stiff. Um, you don't want there to be a lot of play in there, obviously. And so if you think about it like that, the Hemera is going to get bolted on like that. So I'll just put them both down here like this, lay this back on top, and then bolt down through the back. Um, so as mentioned, uh, you can't use any longer than eight millimeter screws 
or you'll bottle them out in the Hamera, damaging the, uh, the tea slots in the process. So don't tighten them down fully until you've got all four threaded. It gives you a little bit of adjustability and wiggle room to make sure everything's aligned um, and make this as squared as possible. And then, with any luck, I can just slide it on like that. Okay, so while I've got it off the unit, um, it'll be a lot easier with it off. Uh, that is one of the nice things about this mount system is that it's so easy to take it off for any kind of maintenance. Uh, I'm going to slide in two more of the E3D provided square nuts. And we're going to attach the fan bracket. So this fan bracket here, it's kind of hard to show you. So this goes like that and the BL touch will ride up and down here. And the BL touch doesn't interfere with any of the exit airflow from the Hemera. You need to make sure that this area stays clear. That's where the hot air is exhausting. Before we get too far along bolting the fan and everything up on here, we need to insert that square nut, the two millimeter aftermarket one, if you will, that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you're lucky, you'll be able to just kind of press it in there with a pair of pliers. Worst case scenario, you can kind of take your soldering iron, put it right in the center of it, heat it up and just kind of melt it in there. I'm just gonna try the press fit method first. Yep, good. And it doesn't need to be completely flush. There's a little bit of uh, space there between that and the fan. So now we'll take our fan bracket here, lay it over top of the T slots. We've inserted the two E3D provided square nuts in the end here and then take the 4020 uh, radial fan, lay it on top. And because of the thickness of our particular bracket, we need the 20 millimeter long M3 screws or bolts. Um, if you have a different thickness of bracket here or a different bracket altogether, the key thing is to make sure that your, the, your screws don't bottom out inside those slots, okay? Um, even if you change to a different fan from this, it might have thicker like standoff regions here, uh, and then you'll need to adjust your screw length accordingly. All right, so I know I don't need all of this slack. I'm just gonna leave myself about six inches or so, get rid of the extra. Um, and lucky for us, the color combination for these wires lines up exactly with the other ones, so there's no confusion as to what to solder those to. Since we've got this still off the printer, we may as well do the rest of the assembly. So take your heater block, and the side with three holes showing, we're going to screw in the nozzle. And leave it so there's, I don't know, just under a millimeter, around a millimeter or so of space between the head of the uh, nozzle and the flush surface of the, of the heater block. And in the opposite side, the side with only the two holes, we're gonna screw in the heat break. Okay. And it'll actually contact the nozzle and should look something like that. And then on the cold side of the heat break, these threads here, we're gonna smear a little bit of this thermal paste. And just kind of like use the packaging to, to brush it on the threads. You don't wanna to go too overboard. I usually make sure that there's a continuous smear of it all the way around the threads there. Not necessarily all the way up and down the threads. I start at the top because it'll kind of work its way down as we screw it in. And then that is going to get threaded in to the bottom of the mirror there. And it'll just go until that little flange on the heat brake contacts the bottom of the Hamera um, heat sink. Okay. That's pretty good. And then as per their documentation, the little opening, little jaw opening, if you will, in the heater block, block uh, is facing us. So it's like that. And it was getting a little tense there uh, as I was turning. Um, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on, but that makes sure, number one, that the heat break is snug into the Hemera body and, uh, 
and everything is kind of like not flopping around as we're doing the rest of the assembly. Now we can take the heater cartridge and the thermistor out of the bag, as well as the fan, it's in the same bag there. And we have a lot of extra wire here, which is great if you were running this on like a custom built machine or something where you need this much length. Um, we only need the you know four or six inches or so that we cut off of the other one. Um, I'll leave a little, little extra. We can always cut it back. So the uh, thermistor here just slides in the end of the heater block and I'm stopping it with my thumb, otherwise it'll just kind of slide right out the other end. And take one of the uh, small grub screws, this is almost impossible to show, it's really small, and the smallest Allen key that we have. So that tiny little screw there. So a little set screw goes in the bottom of the heater block and you want to tighten it just until you feel it press against the um, the heater cart or the thermistor cartridge. You just need it tight enough that that's not going to come loose. And get rid of the heat shrink or the thermal compound. That stuff is messy if you get it on anything. Okay, heater cartridge. Slide it in the same way. Only this one isn't held in by a set screw. Um, which is somewhat unlike the stock hot end, um, we're going to put a screw in here and clamp this shut. So take one of these black M3 screws, there's two of them that are the same length. And just thread it in there. And don't worry about tightening this too much. We'll give it another I don't know, quarter turn or so once we have this all heated up to temperature. And you may have noticed that as I was uh, tightening that, the um, heater block here came loose. So if it if it rotates, you know, righty tighty lefty loosey, right? So if it rotates this way, it'll actually come loose. And if it rotates this way, it will tighten itself back up again. When we heat this all up, um, we're going to uh, tighten this nozzle against the heat break um, at a very high temperature. Um, so that kind of provides some clamping force when it cools back down um, and make sure that that's all sealed. So we'll, we'll do final adjustment there at the end. All right, let's attach the heatsink cooling fan um, and just orient it however you'd like as far as where the cable is coming out of. I'm just gonna have the cable come out the top back side. And then there are only two standoffs that we can screw into using these self-tapping screws, and these are Phillips screws, so you need a Phillips driver. Um, just be careful when you're tapping them in. And by the way, the fan goes label side down, so there is no kind of guard. That's how I kind of remember. Stick your fingers, you're gonna get clipped. So once you got everything lined up, just gentle even pressure, tap them in. Now again, we don't need this to be super tight. It just needs to be tight enough to hold the fan firmly. Um, if you over tighten it, you can actually flex the fan casing. We don't wanna do that. All right, and like with the other wires, I'm just gonna cut some of the extra off. So at this point, um, it would be best to attach the BL touch to the bracket before we attach the bracket to the rest of the unit. We gotta take the BL touch off the factory bracket in order to do so. So it's using just two Allen head bolts, M3s. So if you bought the BL touch like in a kit, if it wasn't pre-installed on your printer, it would have come with some really long, small screws and associated nuts that you could use to attach these two pieces. In our case, we're going to need some M3 screws uh, it doesn't really matter how long they are because we're going to screw them down through the top. So any extra screw will just stick out the bottom. And we'll also need nuts for the bottom, which I'm going to use those same square nuts that we used from before. So the E3D provided M3 silver screws shown here are just long enough that they'll go through my bracket, through the flange on the back of the BL touch and give me plenty of space to um, put a nut on the end. 
And using these square nuts also has another benefit where they won't, they don't even need to be held. They'll actually hit the body of the BL Touch and stop spinning. So those don't need to be super tight, um, but they are definitely tight enough that they're not gonna come loose from vibration or anything. Okay. So that's going to sit there like that. Um, this little nub here, we can use it to kind of zip tie the, the wire assembly onto there. Um, and then everything will kind of come up the side like this. Um, we really don't need a lot of slack. What we kind of want to do is make sure that they're all the same length. Um, Cause we know we cut all these ones the same length. So, If we take something like that, looks pretty good. And just cut them all here. Okay. And the one that we haven't clipped yet is the thermistor. So it has this Molex connector. We'll attach this little pigtail and do the same, do the same thing. Should be at about the same height as the rest of them. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna take a couple minutes. I'm going to solder and heat shrink all of these wires together. Again, the blue and orange, or sorry, blue and yellow for the cooling fan. The two red ones here to the now two yellow ones here for the heater cartridge, the two white are the thermistor. It doesn't matter which goes to which, there's no polarity there. So just connect it to the thermistor ones. Um, and then the red and black are for the always on um, heat sink cooling fan. So I got them all soldered up and I released that zip tie we added earlier on the braided sleeve here, kind of slid it down over top. Um, and I've inserted the PTFE into the Hemera. It just goes like a couple millimeters into the top there. And there's a little locking tab there to keep it, keep it stuck. And then um, you can pull some of the extra slack if you do have too much all the way down through the loom down to the bottom there at the control box. Um, in my case, uh, I think this is fine. Um, nothing's hitting the fan, which is usually a concern. Um, we might want to zip tie the thermistor wire to the heater wires just as a little bit of strain relief because those thermistor wires are really tiny. Um, and then we still have the BL Touch cable that's sitting right there. So the last thing we need to connect you know, aside from the BL Touch, which we'll get to, is the extruder motor cable. Um, so E3D give us this about one meter long uh, stepper motor uh, cable with the correct end on that side and a DuPont on this side. Um, that would work okay if we were connecting it maybe right to the board or something, we could press the DuPont connector on there. Um, but what we have is one of these connectors um, that normally plug into the stepper motor on this side and we need to extend it like this. So we could cut off the ends and solder them together, uh, making sure that we keep the pin out the same um, from one side to the other. Um, or if you have uh, spare extension cables from the Creality extension kit, um, they give you a couple that have the male side that just clip right into this, kind of like these. Uh, we also happen to carry them just as individuals in various lengths. I think this one's 43 centimeters. Uh, it's all we have in stock right now. Um, but as you can see, it's got what looks just like the connector that would be on a stepper motor on that side. So they just plug in like that and now it's longer. Um, one of these alone would not be enough. I want to follow this whole split loom tube path here. Um, and that would only take us to about here. Not quite enough, um, but I can actually daisy chain another one. Um, ideally, you'd have about 70 centimeters or so um, would probably be enough, but now, with no soldering, it goes all the way to the end, um, and it's easy to undo if for some reason we wanted to undo it. Um, we could just pull it off and we haven't uh, had to snip off any, any ends or connectors. Um, so I'm going to feed this inside this split tubing that runs all the way from the control box all the way up to the hot end and connect it here into the stepper motor. All right, so I've run the 
um, stepper motor extension cables all inside the split loom here. Zip tied it all back together and zip tied it gently to this little um, nub at the top here. You don't want to be really crimping uh, or pinching any of those wires over time, they can end up breaking. Um, but it's just, just kind of tight enough to, to not let that uh, whole section slide off. Um, and then over here, I'm just going to add one more zip tie, as I mentioned before, kind of holding the uh, Molex connector to the heater wires. Again, nothing crazy. All right. Great. So now there's no, no slack on those or a little slack on those. Heater cartridge wires are beefy and they're fine. Okay, so now we can finally attach the BL Touch using that spare M3 screw from the uh, Hamera install kit. First, connect the BL Touch's cable, as we mentioned earlier. And then hopefully, I left enough slack. I did, good. Make sure that cable is not getting pinched behind the bracket there. So I've just raised the bracket all the way to the top on this particular mount. You want to make sure that the um, BL Touch probe when fully retracted is obviously higher up than the tip of the nozzle, which it is in this position. Uh, and then when it's extended, it needs to obviously be reaching further down than the tip of the nozzle. And at second glance, I can actually lower this a little bit. But don't worry too much because we are going to set the Z offset and if we need to, we'll readjust that later. Okay. So I think at this point, we can turn it on and at the very least, see if everything still works. Just before we turn it on, I'm going to attach the um, cooling duct here, the fan duct. A little bit of super glue. Pretty liberal with it. And there is some kind of wiggle room here. You just want to make sure it's pushed away from the um, heater block so it's not touching. And then quick spray the activator will hold it in place, kind of like tack welding. If you print um, your fan shroud out of uh, PLA. This particular activator does kind of disdain it, but it won't negatively impact it in any way. This is ABS, so it has no effect. Good. Okay, so let's turn it on. Well, that's a good sign. And the fan over here is spinning. Um, cooling fan's not spinning, so we haven't told it to. But we'll now uh, flip over to the screen. All right, so easiest thing first, let's just check that the cooling fan works. And now we see the cooling fan spin. Good. Um, I'm also just gonna preheat the hot end just to see that the temperature is rising so that we know the heater cartridge and thermistor are working, which we can see right here. That seems to be working, so that's fine. Cool that down. Um, so aside from the stepper motor, which we haven't checked yet, there's no point. Uh, we need to flash first before it has the correct steps per millimeter. So um, let's start flashing the firmware. Okay, for this particular printer, um, we're going to use a Tiny Machines uh, version of Marlin. So we'll include the link to this in the description below. You hit clone or download, download it to your computer, extract it, um, and once it's extracted, you'll open up Visual Studio Code with Platform I.O. Again, uh, links to those in the description, and open the folder for the firmware that you just downloaded and extracted. It will look like this. Now they do have pre-compiled pre versions of the firmware for different printers and configurations. We're not going to use that because ours is a little bit more unique. Um, so if you expand the Marlin folder and double click on configuration.h, 
it will look something like this. Um, I've made little comments here beside each of the lines that I've changed so we can go over each one and what they mean. So obviously this sets up a bunch of defaults for the Ender 5 Plus. All you have to do is uncomment this and make sure you have no other machines defined. Let's look for the next line. Okay, so do we have an E3D hot end? So things like the type of thermistor we're using. Um, yes, we do. So we've enabled this line. I'll also show you um, the line where we actually um, specify the thermistor. So down here, there's a table of all the different thermistors. E3D uses the ATC Semitech 104 GT2, um, which is number five. So if we scroll down here, you can see some logic here where it says, oh, if you've enabled the hot end E3D flag, which we did above, then you will set temp sensor zero to five. If you were not using the Tiny Machines firmware, you would just set temp sensor zero to five. Um, all of this other structure wouldn't be here. Um, likewise, uh, just below, there is the maximum temperatures. Um, so if you have an all metal hot end, which we have, you want to set your heater zero max temp to 300, so they've set it to 315, but we need to make sure it's at least 300 so that we can heat up the E3D hot end to 285 via the LCD. So sorry, let's go back where we were. Okay, so we have an E3D hot end, we have an all metal hot end, we've seen both of those flags and what those do. We also, as far as an extruder goes, we have a Hamera. So this is going to automatically set things like the stepper direction, as well as the steps per millimeter for the extruder. Um, if we look steps per unit, we can see default axis steps per unit is 80, 80. The Z is actually 400, I believe, on this unit. Uh, nope. The machine at Ender 5 Plus, the Z steps per millimeter is 800 for this machine, but the E steps is really what we're concerned about here. Um, and up here, you can see if you've enabled the E3D Hamera, your E steps per millimeter is 409. So if you were doing this yourself, again, not using Tiny Machines firmware, you would set this to 80, 80, your Z steps should be 800, and your E steps should be 409 as per um, E3D's documentation. You also may want to do an E-step calibration afterwards, um, you know, extruding 100 millimeters and measuring to see how accurate that is, and then further refining this value based on those results. So let's go back up. Okay. Um, the other change that I've had to make is the nozzle to probe offset. So this diagram here shows um, where is the probe in relation to the nozzle? Um, since we're using my fan mount and the um, associated BL touch mount, I know that those offsets are three millimeters to the left of the nozzle. So the probe is to the left of the nozzle. It's also in the front of the nozzle. Um, so it's minus 50, so it's about 50 millimeters um, to the front of the nozzle. And it's 4.2 millimeters below the nozzle tip when it hits the bed, okay? This is your Z offset for your BL touch. Um, we can further refine this uh, after we flash. So the bed size, we do lose a little bit of uh, the X. Um, so it's 330 on the X. Um, and the Y is 340 um, as per the mount designer. Um, those are the little bits that we lose in the X and Y directions. The Z is unaffected, still remaining 400. Great, so that's it for that. Um, by default, because this is an Ender 5 Plus, it will also enable linear advance and it will set the K factor to zero. So linear advance is effectively disabled. I mean, it's enabled, but it's not having any impact um, in your prints. Um, you can set the K factor uh, using G code and save it to EEPROM after we flash. So that is all you have to do. Um, you may want to double check uh, your platform io.ini file and just make sure that the environment here is for a mega 18 mega 2560 
This is an 18 mega 2560 based control board in this unit. Um, and so based on that, uh, it will be able to compile it for that platform. So if I hit build, So a little while later, if everything went well, um, you will actually see that it was a success. So it's compiled and now we can connect to the printer with our USB cable and hit upload. When you hit upload, you want to make sure that you have other programs like Cura, for example, closed. Um, otherwise, they can be kind of binding to that serial port or that COM port and uh, your upload won't be able to happen. You'll get um, like a timeout or some other similar error here but we can see that the flash is occurring now, so that's a good sign. Great, so the upload succeeded. Uh, now we should flash the screen firmware. All right, so I've plugged in a uh, micro SD into my laptop here. Um, I think it's gotta be under um, eight gigabytes, and I'm just gonna format it. So FAT32, yeah, it's four gigabytes, um, and 4096 uh, for uh, allocation unit size, and quick format is fine. Hit go. All right, format complete. So now we've got nothing on the USB stick. And so this is the uh, package that we cloned from their GitHub. And inside here, there is a file called CR 10s Pro Max Ender 5 Plus V2 Screen Files dot 7 zip. So you need to have 7 zip installed on your computer. If you have 7 zip, when you right click this, there'll be an option 7 zip, and you can just extract this to a folder. Um, so I'm going to extract it to this folder. There it is. And then all of these resulting files, these are all going to get placed, just copy them onto that USB stick that or the, sorry, micro SD that we just uh, formatted. I keep calling it a USB stick because I have it in a USB adapter. All right, so with that done, we can safely eject this, and then we need to plug it into the bottom of the printer. So tipping the printer on its side, there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six screws. And then this whole bottom plate just pops off. Be careful because this cooling fan in the bottom here is attached. And then right here, there's a micro SD card slot. There we go. And then turn the unit on. There. And so what we see on the screen there is uh, the firmware being flashed. And when it's done, we should get a message saying so. There, so right at the top you see SD card process end. Um, and it, right before that, it was flipping through all the different images that are used on the different screens in the, on the firmware. Great. Turn the printer off, remove the SD card, and then bolt the bottom back up. All right, so let's turn it on. And we should see the Tiny Machines logo. Okay, so let's heat up the hot end and do that hot tightening. Um, so let's go uh, manual and we'll set the nozzle to um, 285. All right, so we're almost at uh, 285. It's just stabilizing there. And so with one wrench here, we're gonna hold the heater block, making sure that we're not um, squishing the thermistor wires or any other wires for that matter. And then with the other, I'm gonna grab the nozzle and just gently tighten it. All 
That's it. Make sure that it's not contacting the fan shroud or anything. It's not. And that was just kind of enough pressure that you just push with kind of one finger. And we can see that the nozzle still has a tiny gap between it and the heater block, which is exactly what we want to see. And so now we can lower that temperature back down, say to 210. And we'll throw the uh, silicone sock on there. Just being careful not to burn yourself. There we go. So let's go to settings, leveling. And if this is your first time in this menu, it will home, but hit home. I've done this a few times. Um, so our Z offset right now is at minus 3.5. Whereas in the firmware, I think we had it set to minus 4.2. And so after hitting home, it does the probe, and then we can check with a piece of paper to see if there's enough drag, and we can move it a little bit closer until there's enough drag, then hit home again. Okay, so I've settled on that. Uh, I've landed at minus 3.6. Um, we can turn auto leveling on. And you actually do that through your G code with G29. It'll do a probe. And so now we're ready to do our first print. A couple quick final notes. So we did remove the extruder from the back. So there's nothing more than just the extruder mount holding the PTFE tube as a guide. So we can still feed this up and under and even through the filament runout sensor if we wanted. Um, we're about to do a test print. We'll show you on the closeout. Uh, but hopefully you found all of that useful. Remember to like and subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when we upload more videos like this. And leave me some comments uh, if you have any questions or concerns or ideas for things you'd like to see on the channel in the future. Thanks for watching.